So uh, I want to welcome you to the webinar about the chances, chances and limits of Pope Francis, a uh, very important text, Laudato to see and other texts. Um, he, uh, and Laudato to see the text he wrote some years ago. But before we start with our discussion about this text, I want to introduce the speakers here and uh, our initiative which organized this webinar. But the very first advice is uh, this webinar will be recorded for documentary um, reasons and well, we, we will see what, what we can do with, uh, with this webinar. Um, first about Dialogue. Dialogue is the initiative uh, which is organizing this uh, webinar. It's an initiative of an international Christian socialist dialogue and uh, it started some years ago. And one of the main starting points, one of the main starting points was the election of Pope Francis. The common question of the socialists and Christians was, and still is, what impact has the fact that the person who is criticizing capitalism and the destruction of climate is the head of the Catholic church now? Some of the members from the European organization Transform and of the Christian University Sofia in Dobbiano in Italy started a process of dialogue. And this is uh, our initiative uh, Dialogue. One first big event was an international summer school in Greece in 2018. Uh, and now we are continuing with some webinars and we will see where we are uh, coming to. This is our first webinar. And uh, we will, as you know, we will discuss about the text of Pope Francis, Lauda to see, and his new text, uh, Fratelli Tutti. And um, well, in the church speech uh, or in the language of the church, it's called an uh, encyclica. Lauda to see is so-called an encyclica and is published in 2015. Its main topic is and was the current climate crisis and the connection of the cl climate crisis and capitalism. A very new move of Pope Francis was the positive reception of a lot of scientific researchers. For its topic, the text is also called the climate encyclica. And not only the topic and the way it was presented was significant. Pope Francis published it some months before the well-known World Climate Conference of Paris, which was held in December 2015. So it was very obvious that he wanted to interfere in the preparation process of this important conference. Even though the release of the encyclica is some years ago, the problem of the climate crisis is obviously still ongoing. But for our discussion, it is less important in which aspects about the climate crisis Pope Francis was right or not. Our aim is to discuss if or in which way Pope Francis and his texts, his encyclicas, can have an impact on the dialogue and cooperation between Christians and socialists. Of course, there were and there are a lot of dialogue initiatives of Christians and Marxists, and they had very profound philosophical and theological reflections. But now the dialogue and the question of cooperation had its starting point in the person of Pope Francis. That means that the dialogue is more focused on a direct political and institutional level. Obviously, a dialogue in this political and institutional field is confronted with a lot of difficulties. In many countries, the hierarchy of the church, of the Catholic church, supports indirectly or directly conservative or right-wing politics. And it's, and it's very difficult nowadays to find any base of trust between the Catholic church and socialists. Even though the Dialogue Initiative is aware of problems like this, it has no solution for this, for this situation. But nevertheless, we try to find paths of dialogue and maybe of cooperation. And this webinar is one step in this direction. 
now I want to uh, present the speakers here. So we have uh, three speakers and me. Uh, I am the moderator. And we start with uh, Petra Steinmeier-Pösel. Petra is a professor and the head of the Institute of Religious Pedagogy of the Catholic Academy of Pedagogy in Feldkirch in Austria. Her domain is social ethics, and she did a lot of research on the encyclica Lauda to See. Petra will give an introduction to Lauda to See and also to the new encyclica Fratelli Tutti. Our next speaker will be Michel Levy. He is Emeritus Research Director in Social Science at the CNRS, the French National Center of Scientific Research. And he also gave lectures at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris, France. Michel Lovy is a philosopher and published uh, a lot of books about Marxism, liberation theology, eco-socialism, and about a lot of more things. <laughs> He will discuss the question in which way Pope Francis offers a communist perspective in his encyclicas. And Cornelia Hildebrandt, she's the head of the European organization Transform and member of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. One of her working fields is the relationship of socialists and Christians. She will comment in which way socialists under and underestimates the encyclicas of Pope Francis, and what can left parties learn from Pope Francis? So, and I am a, I am a theologian who works in the dialogue between Christians and Marxists, and I will moderate this webinar. So what will happen now? Our three speakers will give little comments, and afterwards there is a possibility of questions and of discussion. If you want to speak, you can give uh, a sign in the chat. And if for some reason someone has not the possibility to use the chat, there is still the possibility to raise a hand and give a hand signal like this. Um, so we have, in total, we have time of about 90 minutes. And um, yeah, we will see what um i think we are in a our, our group is uh has the, the the right amount of persons that we can also have a kind of um dialogical way uh, to help this semi uh, webinar okay i will give the word to petra steinmeier pösel thank you very much philip for this uh, kind introduction and thank you for the invitation to give a first uh, introduction now uh, to Laudato Si and especially Fratelli Tutti, which is uh, the new encyclical uh, of Pope Francis. I have prepared um, a PowerPoint presentation to help you follow my uh, reflections, which I now uh, want to share with you, and maybe it can help you uh, to follow my thoughts. Well, uh, last May it has been five years since Laudato Si was published. According to an analysis undertaken by Malcolm McCallum from Langston University, Laudato Si has stimulated the public and ecclesial debates like no other papal document since the highly controversial encyclical Humane Vitae in 1969. However, Unlike the contested Humane Vitae, it is almost unanimously appreciated as a felicitous, authentic, and most timely intervention of a religious leader in a current crisis. In October 2020, five and a half years later, Pope Francis has issued another social encyclical letter titled Fratelli Tutti, on fraternity and social friendship. The first reactions to this new document have been mixed, with criticism aiming especially in two directions, which I briefly want to mention here. Firstly, the document is criticized for not being inclusive enough in the sense of not fundamentally changing the position of women in the church. 
My Fratelli Tutti is a quotation from St. Francis of Assisi. With these words, St. Francis addressed his brothers and sisters and proposed to them a way of life marked by the flavor of the gospel. Pope Francis has been criticized for this title because of its insensitivity regarding gender equality, but also for not being self-critical enough when reviewing the role of women in the church. Secondly, Pope Francis' approach is criticized for being utopian and unrealistic. For example, Protestant theologian Ulrich Kartner utters harsh criticism. He calls the Pope a dreamer. His encyclical letter politically and ethically simplistic. And some of his wordings like, I quote, politics too must make room for a tender love of others, religious kitsch. His criticism could be summarized in the statement that Fratelli Tutti gives too much room to an ethics of conviction and neglects an ethics of responsibility. Moreover, in one of the commentaries of the ongoing debate, I also read a statement I don't want to keep from you today. Um, it said, the Pope is not a utopian, he's a communist. Because of the emphasis he puts on the universal destination of created goods in Fratelli Tutti. But let's get back to this question later, is the Pope a communist? For now, I would like to argue while the first criticism I mentioned seems to bear some truth, I would strongly disagree with Kartner's harsh critique and advice not only a more benevolent, but also a more profound and differentiated reading of Fratelli Tutti. In fact, I suggest understanding Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti as twin documents, which log logically belong to it together and mutually point to each other. While Laudato Si focuses more on the ecological challenges Fratelli Tutti especially takes into consideration the challenges of a highly individualized consumer culture and nationalistic and racist insulation. Both documents are based on the assumption that everything is connected, that we are all in the same boat. Both are quotations, one of Flaratta C, the other of Fratelli Tutti, and that we are not only part of God's one creation, but as God's children made in God's image and likeness, also brothers and sisters to each other. Starting from this assumption, as a hermeneutical key for understanding both documents, I will now offer a short overview of both texts pointing out some important topics of the encyclical letters and denominating some aspects that predestine them as foundational texts for a Marxist Christian dialogue and a transversal social ethical approach, I would say. Both documents include continuation and innovation. While the continuative aspects are made visible by numerous quotations from previous papal documents, I would characterize the innovative aspects as follows. The first one I would call the disputability of the text. Coming from Latin America and being used to tensions with political authorities and even political uh, oppression, Pope Francis does not shy away from entering conflicts directly. With the resoluteness of a pastor with pastoral priorities, he uses understandable language and advances unequivocal messages, even if they are inconvenient to the establishment or break with precedent. Like for example, in Fratelli Tutti, his rejection of just war theory and death penalty. And the second innovative aspect is what I would call the ecumenical interreligious, global, and transversal approach. Laudato Si, as well as Fratelli Tutti, offer Catholic social teaching in a truly ecumenical, interreligious, inter global, and transversal perspective. 
as Pope Francis does not only quote his predecessors, but also local bishops conferences around the globe, thus including reflections and insights of local churches. He also includes the often marginalized voices of mystics like Francis, Therese of Lisieux, John of the Cross, and social activists like Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Desmond Tutu, and others. Moreover, he considers orthodox spirituality, sources from Judaism, the wisdom of other world religions, and in Fratelli Tutti, especially the grand Imam Ahmad al Tayyip. And finally, he also draws on the results of the best scientific uh, research avail available today, sorry. And also to international documents and institutions based on different worldviews. In this sense, we could attribute to Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti alike an ecumenical, interreligious, global, and even rudimentary transversal character. And thirdly, Pope Francis makes explicitly clear that with his encyclical letters, he does not only address Catholics, Christians, or even other religious believers, but wants to enter into dialogue with all people living on this planet without exception. In Laudato Si, he writes, I quote, I urgently appeal then for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet. We need a conversation which includes everyone. Since the environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. And at the beginning of Fratelli Tutti, he writes, I offer this social encyclical as a modest contribution to continued reflection in the hope that in the face of present day attempts to eliminate or ignore others, we may prove capable of responding with a new vision on fraternity and social friendship that will not remain at the level of words. Although I have written it from the Christian convictions that inspire and sustain me, I have thought to make this reflection an invitation to dialogue among all people of goodwill. And a little bit later, he says, let us dream then as a single human family, as fellow travelers sharing the same flesh, as children of the same earth, which is our common home, each of us bringing the richness of his or her beliefs and convictions, each of us with his or her own voice, brothers and sisters all. Thus, Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti are an invitation to, and I would also say, also a result of the practice of an open dialogue. Here, the attribute open seems essential and maybe addresses what we in our dialogue project would call a kenotic dialogue. This quality of openness or kenosis expresses that the goal of sharing experiences and perspectives in a dialogue is mutual understanding, not, for example, the advancement of one's own particular interests and ideas. This profoundly dialogical character is the third aspect I would like to mention here as innovative trait of both encyclicals and Pope Francis uh, is perfectly clear that such a transversal approach and open kenotic dialogue is indispensable today. In the next step, I would like to talk a little bit about the composition of Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti. Um, because the composition is very much in line of, of this general approach. In Laudato Si 15, Pope Francis describes the composition of Laudato Si as follows. He says, I will briefly, uh, I will begin by briefly reviewing several aspects of the present ecological crisis with the aim of drawing on the results of the best scientific research available today, let it, letting them touch us deeply and provide a concrete foundation for the ethical and spiritual itinerary that follows. That's the cause and status quo as the first step. The second step, recollection of normative basis here, he says, I will then consider some principles drawn from the Judeo-Christian tradition which can render our commitment to the environment more coherent. Third step, 
is the in-depth analysis. He says, I will then attempt to get to the roots of the present situation so as to consider not only its symptoms, but also its deepest causes. In the fourth step, he develops his vision. He says, this will help to provide an approach to ecology which respects our unique place as human beings in this world and our relationship to our surroundings. In the fifth step, in the light of the reflection of this vision, uh, he advances some broader proposals for dialogue and action, which would involve each uh, of uh, the readers as individuals, but also affects international policy. This step I would call proposals for multiple dialogues and action. And in the sixth and last step, uh, he says, finally, uh, convinced as I am that change is impossible without motivation and a process of education, I will offer some inspired guidelines for human development to be found in the treasure of Christian spiritual experience. In this step I would call spiritual foundation and education. So that's um, the composition of Laudato Si. And as you see, I would call it a little bit cyclical because uh, Pope Francis um, addresses topics several times during the encyclical and the same happens uh, in Fratelli Tutti, uh, which is a little bit uh, similar, but uh, there are some differences. Uh, Fratelli Tutti also starts with reviewing some aspects of the present uh, and uh, here he focuses now on the social crisis, addressing especially the challenges of a fragmented world lacking a plan for everyone, like insufficiently universal human rights, the pandemics, migration and the absence of human dignity on the borders, the illusion of media-based mass communication, subjection and self-contempt. Uh, this is the description of the status quo in Fratelli Tutti. Then follows in the attempt to search for a ray of light in the midst of what we are experiencing. This is a quote uh, of Pope Francis, a meditation of Jesus' parable uh, of the Good Samaritan. This I would call here this recollection of normative basis, going back to this uh, very important parable of um, the New Testament. Unlike Laudato Si, after that follows Pope Francis' attempt, attempt of envisaging and engendering an open world, moving beyond ourselves, um, open societies that integrate everyone, re-envisaging the social role of property and so on. So after this recollection of normative basis uh, in Fratelli Tutti follows this vision of, uh, of an open world. After that follow two chapters, uh, chapters four and five, that analyze necessary changes and shifts in um, perception regarding the topics of migration, borders, reciprocal gifts, uh, for example, the relevance of the other for the own identity and the relationship between the local and the universal, as well as regarding a better kind of politics. Here the Pope reflects on forms of populism and liberalism, on social and political love. Uh, I would call this the in-depth analysis in Fratelli Tutti. Then chapter six calls for dialogue and friendship in society. Uh, this is maybe parallel to the proposals for multiple dialogues and action in Laudato Si. And then chapter seven focuses on truth, peace, forgiveness and memory. Here, uh, Pope Francis points out that forgiving means not forgetting, but uh, is an important uh, basis for renewed encounter after failure and collapse. So this is a, a thought, a new thought here in Fratelli Tutti that we don't find in that form in Laudato Si before. And this chapter also climaxes in Pope Francis' rejection of war and death penalty. And finally, the last chapter addresses the role of religions at the service of fraternity and solidarity in our world, as well as the relationship between violence and religion. And he especially uh, stresses that uh, religions must never 
uh, call for violence, which is maybe especially important to mention today after uh, the horrible terror attacks in Vienna last night. Um, let me go on to uh, give you an idea of some of the core topics of the, of the two encyclical letters. Um, and I think those core topics uh, can also be core topics for our uh, transversal uh, dialogue. The first topic is uh, ecological crisis. <laughs> um, Climate and anthropogenic climate change, as well as environmental degradation, pollution, and the rapid extinction of species are ethical core challenges in the Anthropocene. Thereby the interrelatedness of uh, the ecological crisis and the vulnerability of the poor and marginalized has to be taken into consideration from the very beginning. They are two sides of a coin. And you see, I uh, marked Laura to see uh, in, in bold letters saying this is especially a topic of Lada to see, but it also is a topic of Fratelli Tutti. A second important topic then is the common good and the universal destination of goods. Um, basically, the Pope here builds on what has already been elaborated uh, in the social compendium of the church. Um, but the genuine contribution lies in the application of this social teaching to the current situation and challenges, ecological as well as social. So this is a topic that is really present in both encyclical letters. A third core topic I would call uh, the preferential option for the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized. Also a topic present in both encyclicals, Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti. Um, another core topic then is um, the technocratic paradigm, throwaway culture, and uh, the economy of uh, exclusion. While the Pope highly estimates science and technology as means to achieve the common good, he sees them as problematic if they are oriented towards the wrong goals of domination and exploitation, and if they produce an illusion of communication in a profoundly fragmentized, cynical, and indifferent world. The throwaway culture and an economy of exclusion then are the logical consequence of the technocratic paradigm. Another uh, core topic that is uh, especially present in Laudato Si, but also uh, has uh, some uh, instances in Fratelli Tutti is uh, this notion of rapidification and consumerism. I only want to mention this briefly here. Uh, then uh, one core topic in Fratelli Tutti is of course the relationship between the local and the universal. And uh, Pope Francis says that we need a universal approach or attitude that is in contact with the local. The metaphor for this must not be the globe, but the polyhedron. We might talk about this later in the discussion. I think that's a very interesting idea of understanding this um, unity and diversity with this met metaphor of the polyhedron, uh, which he uh, especially uh, stresses in uh, Fratelli Tutti. And then, of course, in Fratelli Tutti, which is also interesting for us today, is that he talks about a better kind of politics. Pope Francis differentiates between popular and populist politics and politicians. Uh, here, uh, it is important to remember his Latin American background, where the people is an important notion against the people, against the elites. It, it, that, that differs a lot from the German expression Volk, which in the German language, of course, is a little bit a difficult, difficult term. Um, and a third and, and a final core topic, I think, is healing and forgiveness. And when Pope Francis talks about the necessity of forgiveness that is based in truth and does not mean to forget, but essentially includes the memory of the victims, it becomes very clear that he's not a naive dreamer, as, um, as Cardinal says. He's very well aware of human atrocities, as well as the indispensability of a long and difficult path of healing for any peaceful common future. Now, this brings me to um, a, a, another uh, point that seems important to me, which is the increasing relevance of dialogue uh, in both, in fact, both encyclicals. 
can be read as one comprehensive invitation and even exhortation to dialogue. Um, Pope Francis time and again invites all human beings to an open dialogue in uh, Laudato Si as well as in Fratelli Tutti. And in, and, and in both encyclicals, there are uh, chapters that talk uh, explicitly about the necessity and uh, the relevance of, uh, of multi-level dialogue. Uh, I, I want to make this brief because I saw that I already used up my time, so I want uh, to come to an end. I, I brought uh, with me uh, this um, a graph showing uh, a differentiation between dialogue and other forms of, of um, discourse, uh, which Pope Francis even addresses himself in, in Fratelli Tutti. And, and uh, just to make clear how important it, it is to, to him, uh, the word dialogue um, is, uh, is uh, you, you, can word, you can find the word dialogue 41 times in the text of Fratelli Tutti, which is uh, indeed quite a lot. Um, to conclude, I, uh, as a theologian, I want to briefly point out to the indispensability of the spiritual dimension of the encyclical letters, both encyclical let letters, which uh, gives both of them a confiding and resilient key tone in spite of the almost overwhelming challenges um, and uh, forms the framework and hermeneutical key to understanding the two texts. Both encyclicals, already in their titles, evoke the relatedness of human beings to the transcendent other, the big other, whom we call God. In order to see, the title expresses a direct dialogue of a human being with God. And Fratelli Tutti, the mutual relationship of brothers and sisters, um, in, in, in Fratelli Tutti, the mutual relationship of brothers and sisters points back to the relationship to their common parent to God. Each time, uh, different kinds of prayers then conclude the text. So this is kind, kind of framework, a spiritual framework to both encyclical letters. Against this background, I would say, in fact, we might argue that only by repeatedly intermitting our inner and outer dialogues, discussions and debates in order to enter into contemplation understood as a dialogue with the transcendent source and, and um, we being silent, being still, can we authentically and kinotically then relate to all of creation and to our fellow human beings, our brothers and sisters, as Pope Francis would say. So that was my brief uh, overview of both texts. I hope that gave you a little bit of an idea of my reading of it. And uh, I brought with me two questions that would really interest me now uh, for, for my two dialogue partners, uh, Connie Hillebrand and uh, Michel Levy, um, which are, what do you think? Is Pope Francis really a communist, um, as uh, somebody wrote um, on an internet forum? And the other, Pope Francis was uh, criticized for being utopian and his notion of political love as religious kitsch. What do you think about his appeal for a better kind of politics in service of the common good? So. Two questions from me to you, and now I'm really eager to listen to how you read the both encyclical letters. Thank you very much for listening to, to this. Yeah, thank you very much, Petra, for this uh, um, very, very uh, uh, big introduction to Fratelli Tutti and Lauda to See. When we started the planning this webinar, we had all uh, just allowed us to see in mind, uh, and Fratelli Tutti was not published yet. Uh, now we have, uh, since some weeks, um, Fratelli Tutti 2, and uh, it's also interesting, of course, what is uh, written there. Um, and um, so you had the, uh, the double amount of uh, text to introduce into. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, and you started your, uh, um, your introduction also with the question, is uh, Pope Francis a dreamer? Is he a communist? Um, at least uh, uh, in the question of, of dreamer, uh, you said very clearly that you don't think, um, or you gave reasons uh, why he is not a dreamer. 
because he he um, uh, he focuses on uh, uh, very important uh, social questions uh, um, of nowadays, of the climate crisis, of the common goods, um, of the uh, of the te technocratic paradigm, and so on. But we will go uh, now a little bit more deeper in the question uh, uh, of uh, um, in which way uh, Pope Francis can be seen also as a communist or maybe just as a dreamer. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, so the next uh, um, the next speaker will be uh, Michel Levy. And uh, so I introduced you before, so you can just uh, go into your presentation. Okay. Um, I'm very pleased that we have the opportunity to continue this Marxist Christian dialogue, which we started some years ago. Even if it takes a virtual form, we don't have the kind of contact we had in the previous meetings. Yeah? due to the circumstances. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Petra for her very beautiful presentation, really very interesting. And I particularly liked this concept of kinotic dialogue. Yeah? I think this is a very, very powerful idea. Now, um, I will limit my comments on Laudato Si, yeah? for various reasons, because I know better the issue of ecology. So I, I will talk mainly about this. Now, I would say, I don't think that Pope Francis is a communist. I think it's not an adequate definition, but I think he's a dreamer. Yeah, he's a dreamer. And in the sense that Martin Luther King was a dreamer. Yeah, you know that Martin Luther King started his famous talk, I have a dream. Yeah? We need dreams. Uh, the Marxist philosopher Ernst Bloch yeah, wrote a lot about the importance of dreaming. Yeah? Dreaming with open eyes, yeah? not when you are sleeping. Yeah? The dreaming while you are awakened. Yeah? This is very important because without dreams and without utopias, we cannot change the world. Yeah? So I would uh, yes, I, I would accept, I, I would agree that <coughs> Pope Francis is an utopian and a dreamer. Be, and I, I think these two things are necessary ingredients of any emancipatory politics, huh? including that of the Marxists. Huh? Okay. Now, uh, Laudato Si is clearly a major event, yeah? a major event from a theological viewpoint, of course, but also from an ethical, a social, a political, yeah? from all viewpoints. And uh, it is a crucial contribution to developing a critical ecological consciousness. Yes, on a world scale, yeah? on a world scale. So I think it's a real unique document of the greatest importance. And I recommend to my Marxist friends, please read Laudato Si. Yes, you will learn a lot of, on it on re by reading it. Yes, and uh, not only read it, study it. Yeah. You should, they, they should study. And I would be very happy if all Marxists had the profound understanding of what means climate change and uh, the ecological disaster as does Pope Francis in this encyclical. Yeah? So it is real, I think a model for us who try to think about the ecological crisis. Now, in my short comments, I will emphasize on the most important aspects for me as a Marxist and as a eco-socialist. Yeah? 
I know the encyclical is much richer, has all kinds of issues which are interesting, but I, I will focus on those. Well, uh, the first thing which I think is, is very important is the idea that the ecological issue and the social issue are inseparable. Yeah? They are inseparable. That means for Francis, the same perverse economic structure is responsible for social inequality, poverty, social exclusion, and ecological disasters, global warming, etc. Yeah? They are the result of the same cause. They are inseparable. And therefore, he says, the protest, the claymore of the earth and the protest, the claymore of the poor are inseparable. Yeah? I think this is a very, very important insight and it's something which appeared already in the writings of some liberation theologians like Leonardo Boff, etc. And here it is very, very one of the main tenets of Laudato Si. Now, the other important thing is that the ecological crisis and global warming has terrible threat for life in the planet, eh? that's very clearly in the encyclical, a terrible threat for human and not for all forms of life in the planet, is not the result of mainly of individual actions. Eh? It's not an issue of individual goodwill or bad will, although this has some importance, it it's, has it's something which has to do with a certain system, a global system, which is a mode, a certain mode of production and consumption. Now, Francis doesn't use the word capitalism. Okay, he's not a Marxist, right? But the idea is clearly there. Yeah? It's the present global dominant mode of production and consumption, yeah? It's a system, I quote from the encyclical, a system of commercial relations and property, which is structurally perverse, end of the quote, structurally perverse. Yeah? So this is not, of course, a purely academic analysis of the economic mode, it is a moral one. Yeah? And this, I think, is very important. So we have here a system uh, which is structurally perverse. This is very important because among many naive, good-willing ecologists uh, believe that the whole problem is that individuals have bad practices. They leave the tap open, uh, wasting water. Yeah, They don't throw in the right basket the waste. Yeah, And etc, uh, etc. Et I won't give all the examples. Yeah? And, and Pope Francis says, yes, of course, individual behavior is important, but the main issue is the system, yeah? the global system, which is structurally perverse. I think it's very, very, very important. And of course, we, Marxist socialists, entirely agree. Yes. Now, what are the perverse elements of the system? Why is it a perverse system? And here are some aspects. Yeah? First, it's a system based on the principle of maximization of profit. That's the only thing which counts. Yeah? more and more profit. What are the activities which will bring me a maximum of profit and full stop, no other criteria. Yeah? So, and therefore it's a world system, economic system where speculation and finance rent predominate. Yeah? 
because these are the sources of profit. Yeah? And since the only important thing is maximization of profit, speculation, and rent, uh, human dignity and the environment are irrelevant, yeah? are completely irrelevant. Therefore, the result of this perverse economic system is the degradation of human life, of human dignity, and of the environment, of our common house, or of mother nature. Yeah? And another uh, perverse aspect of the system, it's, it divinizes, I don't know if the word exists in English, uh, the market, yeah? It makes of the market the absolute God, yeah? And uh, everything is reduced to the market and everything is reduced to, I quote, financial calculations of costs and benefits. Now, says Pope Francis, there are some things in the world which cannot be reduced to calculations. There are some values like human dignity, human life, nature, our common house, which cannot be reduced to quantitative calculations of price and profit, yeah? of costs and benefit. Financial calculations of cost and benefit cannot uh, uh, explain everything yeah? and are not the supreme criteria. So uh, this diagnosis of Pope Francis in Laudato Si of the ecological crisis, I didn't go into the, all the details how he discusses the ecological crisis on the basis of the scientists. Yeah, he takes very seriously the science, the uh, international uh, um, scient uh, climate scientist uh, body, etc. Uh, uh, calculations, their uh, provisions, etc. So he uh, makes a diagnosis of the ecological crisis, uh, of the Anthropocene, of the impending catastrophe, the threats to life, to human life, and at the same time, the diagnosis of the causes yeah, of this disaster. And these causes, as I showed, have are of a systemic nature. Good. I think this is extremely important. And this is what gives, in my view, its unique value to this document. Yeah? It's a document which, as I said, all socialists, all Marxists, all ecologists should read. Yeah, Because many ecologists, their understanding of the ecological crisis is much weaker, much more confused, and much less relevant than the one which Pope Francis presents in Laudato Si. Now, what is the alternative to this perverse mode of production of property, etc., huh? to this perverse economic structure? Well, first, uh, in fact, Pope Francis calls for an alternative. And the alternative, he calls it an ecological culture huh? and a new style of life, which I entirely agree, of course. Yeah? We need a new ecological culture and a new style of life. But some questions remain without answer in the encyclical. For instance, who are the actors of the change? Yeah? Who are the social and political actors to uh, develop this uh, transformation, yeah? this new culture and new style of life. There isn't much in the encyclical. The encyclical says it's not the elite 
it's not the oligarchy, it's not the powerful, it's not they who are going to change things. Yeah. So we unfortunately we can't expect much from them. Yeah, it, it says it very clearly. But who then? No answer in the encyclical. But in other occasions, uh, Pope Francis gave an answer to this question. For instance, when he went to Bolivia in the same year, 2015, and he met the social movements in Bolivia, in Santa Cruz, July 2015. And what did, what did he say to the social movements? Here I quote, the future of humanity is in your hands. You, the humblest, the exploited, the poor, the excluded, you are the sowers of the seeds of change. Yeah, a very important statement. And I think this completes the encyclical. What the encyclical doesn't say here, his conference to the social movements in Bolivia says, yeah, the actors of the change are the social movement of the poor, the oppressed and the excluded. And we, as Marxists, as eco-socialists, entirely agree with this statement. Yeah? Now, the other question which is not answered in the encyclical is, what are the economical, social, and political changes necessary in order to establish this new ecological culture and this new style of life? Pope Francis mentions a few things. He mentions communitarian organization. He mentions some measure of degrowth. And he even mentions the need of a great strategy is his term to stop the environmental degradation. But what is the strategy? He doesn't answer. Yeah? So, um, as a Marxist, I believe that some drastic changes in property are needed and a rapid defacing out of fossil energies. Yeah? These are the conditions for an ecological transition. That's my belief as a eco-socialist. Yeah? Now, of course, uh, strategy is not, is a domain of political and social force. It's not the role of the church to give a program, a political program, a political strategy. Okay, yeah? so I think this explains the limited, the self-limitation of the encyclical. Yeah? The role of the church is to give a diagnosis of what is happening and propose a road, a propose a moral alternative, but a strategy, it's the task of the political and social forces. And in my opinion, eco-socialism has a good proposal. Now, I will come now to just one last aspect, which is one of the questions given to the talk to the speakers. This webinar was, what should be our next common step? And I would give just one example of something we could do together. We, Marxists, socialists, and Catholics. Yeah? Uh, just one concrete example. Uh, we need a world campaign of solidarity with the Brazilian indigenous communities in the Amazon forest. Okay, you will say it's because I'm Brazilian, okay, that I'm saying this. No, the Amazonian forest is an issue for the humanity as such, because it's the last great uh, wall, well of carbon, which is absorbing the dioxide of carbon, which is in the atmosphere provoking global warming. If the Amazonian forest is destroyed, global warming will inevitably accelerate and will become incontrollable. Yeah? So the defense of the Amazonian forest is an issue for the whole humanity. But those who are concretely fighting to defend the forest are some 
mainly, not only, but mainly some indigenous communities. Yeah? And they badly need our support because they are disarmed, they are poor, and they are confronted with big business, big agro-business, which has the support of the police and of the Brazilian government. Yes? Brazil has a neo-fascist government whose leader, the President Jair Bolsonaro, has already said several times, the indigenous communities are the enemies of progress and we need to develop agriculture and clean up the forest for raising cattle, etc. So this is what's going on in Brazil now. And so it is very important for us. And as you probably know, the Catholic Church in Brazil has been very active in defense of the indigenous communities and of the Amazon forest. Yeah? So it's not something new together with ecologists, eco-socialists, etc. But what we need now is a international campaign, yeah? a world campaign, also in Europe. Yeah? Europe is very important here in solidarity with the indigenous communities and in defense of the Amazon forest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michel Levy, for your comment on the question if uh, Pope Francis is a communist or not. And um, what I really liked was uh, the comment, uh, uh, another understanding of the word to, to, to dream or uh, to be a dreamer. Um, I think the comment uh, before was, uh, or the sense of uh, Pope Francis uh, being a dreamer, he is, he is a illusion uh, that he has illusions uh, or, or concepts which will not work. But you said, well, um, without uh, dreams and without uh, utopia, we're not able uh, to, to go a step forward uh, uh, to change the world. Um, and. Uh, especially Ernst Bloch and uh, Martin Luther King and a lot of other people, persons uh, were, uh, yeah, were dreamers uh, who gave the possibility for the world to change. Um, I really like this. And I think the another question of, of is Pope a, com a communist or not? Well, you said, this is, in fact, you said this is not the, the, the important question. The question or the, the important thing is, um, he comes to uh, a lot of important uh, results uh, which uh, we Marxists can agree on. And um, even more that he presents us a connection of the different um, social and ecological crisis or, or parts of this crisis uh, uh, where the Marxists or socialists can learn a lot about. Um, the next sp uh, speech we will have uh, will focus uh, on this point, uh, what we can learn, uh, what we as Marxists can learn uh, of uh, hmm. Pope Francis and uh, in which way a lot of uh, socialists are underestimating uh, this, um, uh, this text of Pope Francis and what, what is lacking then for the, Christian, uh, for the socialists. Hmm. Um, and your concrete idea, Michel Levy, I think we can talk about uh, this uh, in the discussion later. But now I will give uh, the word to Connie Hildebrand. Yeah, many thanks. It's Pope Francis a communist or not? It's not so easy to explain. I would say yes. the communist, the communist, when we have the understanding of, of communism, of a radical change of society in the direction of an association of equal and free people. In such, such way, such new understanding uh, to change the whole system. That is, uh, in this way, you, you can say, you can find some communist ideas in uh, Fratelli Tutti. And if you ask myself, uh, is uh, Pope Francis an utopist? I would say he is a melancholic dreamer. <laughs> melancholic dreamer. Because the sound of the new social encyclical has a melancholic color for me. 
it is not such a powerful voice of um, uh, Evangeli Gaudium, who sentences like, this economy kills stick in my memory. It is not the enlightening analytic language of Laudato Si. It's a language of experiences, of dissolutionments, and the look at the unsolved problems in the world, the dissolutionments in the face of the continuing the financial speculation after the crisis 2008, the continuation of slav labor of workers, the face of organ and human trafficking. In this view, is the continuing development, Pope Francis cannot be described the alternative as an illusion. No, he described it as, as a call, as a finally call to act. And therefore, is his social ecological, social encyclical is addressed to all people, of course, regardless of religion or non-religion, but it is addressed in several special ways to those who have political responsibilities. This dimension was represent also in Laudate Si, and I would say it's stronger emphasized in, in Fratelli Tutti. Fratelli Tutti is in continuity of his thinking since Evangelii Gaudium. The criticism of neoliberal globalization the consequences of which are still visible with the corona crisis. He described the different forms of indifferences, a culture without empathy on solidarity, a culture and world order that allows people to be threaded like wasp. The real virus, and that he described in uh, Fratelli Tutti, is the neo neoliberalism and populism which is accompanied by threaded and content. Both meet with segregation and isolation, one from the poor, the other from the strangers. These virus, neoliberalism, with a strategy to keep it up, and nationalism and racism are also discussed on the left. The problem of populism is also being discussed also in confrontation with the left-wing populism. And some of the argument of Pope Francis are similar to my own arguments. And independent of this concrete point, it's amazing for me to see the great proximity pro of discourses. So similar ideas and thinking. He described love as political love, love and social friendship as a path to an alternative. It's a task of love to break the dynamic in the direction of indifferences, ignorance, and contempt for the oppressed, abandoned, and invisible people. Marx also had this people in his mind when he said the categorical imperative at the end of the criticism of religion, his demands to overthrow all relations in which man is debased, enslaved, abandoned. And another point reminds me of Marx. Pope Francis described man as a social being. Man cannot exist alone. It's always needs the others. Only in the community can problems be lost, lost solved. Therefore, the focus of all actions must be community. This means the social action, but also the economy. The economy must be an economy for life. And to life belongs humans <clears throat> and nature, of course. That means the goods for life must belong to the community. Everything that a person needs to life in dignity must be available for every person, regardless where she or she was born. Living goods must be produced by the community, for the community, must plan with the community, has to decide it with the community, and not in the direction of profit. In this direction, I would say, he is a little bit communist. Mm -hmm. This goods naturally include health, food, humanistic education, housing, culture, common goods. 
And for me, is it good to know that Pope Francis write that a social and political order is needed, who solves the social love to the neighbor, and he sees the responsibility of politicians here. But he is also seeing the role of the social movements worldwide. And it was the solution of the World Social Forum to explain another world as possible. And the next, next sentence is also important in this moment. One world in which many worlds have room. The question of unity and diversity. You can find the translation between both, between the social movements and the learning process of the Pope and also of the social movements in the past. Pope Francis called for a new world or ca order characterized by love and fraternity, social friendship. And he described the role of the religion. Also the question on the table is the role of the politics. And he addressed the politics directly best politics, sound policies, which can be based on reformed institution. He speaks about poor policies, politics only itself interest, good politics to serve ways to build communities, good policies to build bridges, to build bridges in different directions. And for me, is it a little bit surprising that no, of the politicians, neither in Germany nor in other countries, do not take up this message. Maybe is it the task of the left to bring this message of the Pope also in the direction of our politicians. He deals the populism and liberalism. Remarkable is a confrontation of the concept of populism with the tendency of polarization and exclusion and the liberalism of unbridled individualism. What is the political answer? We discuss in the left in Germany the idea of the third pole. The third pole, that means independent of racism, neoliberalism, to build their own pole for a fundamental change of the direction of policy in the direction of the social ecological transformation. And Michael, when you described the Pope has not a strategy, cannot develop a strategy, is not his task. We are open to do so as a politicians, as a political actors. His idea is the political love. I would say a wonderful formulation. Political love is engagement. Political love is organization and structuring of society in which the neighbor does not have to live in misery. To think spiritually and political in the same frame. And I would say that is a challenge for the left. Most in the, uh, the most people on the left replace love with struggle, class struggle, in the interest of working class, for example, or mainly in the interest of working class. The left is characterized by working class struggle. This class struggle is per permeated in all struggles, including the climate struggle, the struggle for social justice, for democracy, for peace, of course, also for women rights. Corona also shows us the virus does not affect every body in inequality. People to small flats, nurses, de 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 delivery services, and so have not the same resources as the richest people, as the richest class. Class is not only an ideology. Class is social class. Is an re re expression of the economic and political order. Class is reality, and class struggle is also the reality. Marx explains that the human history is a human history of class struggle. Why I, I explain it? The class, the class struggle brings in conflict. The question is how we can bring together the political love and the class struggle. What could be the answer for this? 
one point from my side or from the left hand side. Class struggle are not the target of struggles. The goal of the left, and here we are very close to Pope Francis, is a society of free and equal, a classless society. The question is how we can come from the class struggle to the classless society. I would say it's open, it's an open question also for the left. Pope, Fem, Pope, Pope Francis give us some good proposals. The common struggle against the financial speculation. We have some proposals on the, from the left on the table. The rethinking of property concerning social duty of property that we can formulate really precisely on the European level, on the global level, but also on the municipal level, concrete. Life properties must be by common property, including nature, of course. Good work, good work and good working condition for all, include the people under the head of the Christian institution, of course. And here, one remark from my side, working class. It's not only that the church has some differences to the working class, some distance to the working class. Also the left. The left explained we are left-wing parties, we are working class parties. But in, in reality, in the last years, in the last 10 years, we can see that the working class voted for the radical white or for white populist parties. We have both the open question in this moment. We have both open challenges. What we can do, I think, is for the next step, we have to find we have to find concrete project. And maybe could you propose, Michael, to use the Amazon problem to find a common strategy or maybe a kind of common ideas to lose this problem together, to find this way and to find concrete projects together. And uh, that is the first step that we are doing in this in the webinar. And maybe is it easier for the others to find such kind of problems and helping me in this way. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Connie Hildebrand, for your, for your speech, for your last speech. Um, uh, yeah, I'm very surprised or, or very happy also to, uh, that you spoke uh, about uh, about love and uh, the relationship between love and class struggle. Um, and um, yeah, so it's not that we have our experts here in uh, as speakers, but also as participants of this webinar. Uh, and uh, I invite everybody uh, to. Uh, to have go in the discussion um, uh, with the with our three um, with each other and our three speakers, um, and Barbara, uh, she has an overview who is giving a, a, a hand signal or a comment in the chat, and she will um, yeah she will organize now the discussion. I hope. Hi everybody! I have no requests for the floor yet, so please don't be shy. Um, Either put your name in the chat or you can also raise your hand. Karin, please briefly introduce yourself uh, at the beginning. And then hey. after Karin, Federico. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Karine. I'm, uh, I work with Transform as a translator and I'm, I'm French. And um, I have worked over the several decades uh, with the left, with the communists in France, with um, all the left. And um, I'm a Christian, which is not very easy in France, but uh, anyway. But um, 
I just had a question actually uh, for um, uh, Philippe, maybe, or uh, those who know uh, the Catholic Church well. I wanted to know because I'm not a very active Christian. Yeah, yeah, I presented myself like that, but I don't know much about the, the internal um, movements inside uh, the contemporary church. And I wanted to know if uh, Pope Francis could convince people inside the church beyond the people who were already convinced by him from the beginning. If he could reach uh, beyond his basis inside the church. And maybe I can, uh, as I have the floor, say that in the newspapers here in France, uh, th there was some echo uh, about uh, both texts and um, they were quite good. And I think uh, I have the feeling, and this is a question, I have the feeling that Pope Francis tries to convince people uh, largely. Uh, we talked about the audience that he was addressing with these texts. And I really think he tries to mobilize people like uh, we would love to do. And he tries to convince people where he, wherever he can. But what is his audience and is it growing inside the church? Thank you, Karin. Uh, I propose to collect uh, some comments and questions and then uh, give back uh, also to the speakers. I have uh, Federico uh, and then Angelina Roland and I see Karl Helmut and Jose Manuel. Federico. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the three speakers for your very interesting speeches actually. And uh, I'm Federico, and I'm a researcher in, um, in the philosophy of education and a collaborator of the Sofia University Institute. And I have two questions, actually, one more uh, practical or political and another one more conceptual. And the more political one is, uh, is more of a contribution, actually. Uh, I wanted to add to what Michel Levy, you said, uh, about uh, the possible um, convergence in organization around uh, the big questions like uh, the Amazon forest, um, is that I, I wanted to stress uh, the fact that um, these texts by Pope Francis are also uh, very um, revolutionary in a sense, because political participation uh, has always been a problem from the Catholic point of view. I mean, um, has always been a problem inside the Catholic Church to understand if uh, the role of a Catholic in society is to join uh, another political force which uh, fights for values uh, the Catholics can share, or if the Catholics have to organize among themselves to contribute to political life. So in the ecological crisis, uh, I mean that this is also, uh, this is also a question for, for Catholics, I mean. And the second question is this one. Um, reading uh, Fratelli Tutti, especially, um, I noticed that um, Papa Francesco uses the terms uh, fraternity and social friendship. But if I remember well, he never uses the word solidarity. Uh, do you think this is intentional? There's a conceptual difference. And if if there is, uh, which one is? Thanks. Thank you. And Connie reminded me that uh, Michelle might have to leave earlier, so I don't collect any further comments and questions. And uh, for the time being, give now the floor back to the speakers. And then I have on the list afterwards Angelina, Roland, Karl Helmut, and Jose Manuel. Um, thank you all for your contributions. I'm Angelina Yanopoulou. I, I wanted to give the floor to Michel because Connie reminded me that he might have to leave earlier. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Okay, uh, let me just answer the question of uh, Federico. Look, uh, 
let me give the concrete example of Brazil, which I'm familiar because it changed in different countries. In Brazil, in general, and also specifically in relation to the Amazonian issue, you have an, an action of specific Catholic organizations. For instance, the CIMI. The CIMI is the indigenous missionary uh, organization of the church. Yeah? So it's the, this organization of the church to uh, work with the indigenous communities. At the beginning, mainly to convert them as missionaries, but then more and more in solidarity with the indigenous communities. And so this is very important institutions, very active, and uh, really uh, has a decisive role in relation to the indigenous uh, defense. Yeah? Now, then you have the base communities of the church, the base communities which exist locally in the Amazonian area, which organize Christians, Catholics mainly, in, and many of them are committed to the fight for the struggle in defense of the forest, etc. And then you have the church itself, the bishops, yeah, the bishops, the conference of the bishops, who takes statements in defense of the Amazonian, etc., criticizing the politics of the government. So these are specific actions of the Catholic Church and its various institutions, etc. But then you have also, uh, yes, and I forgot, very important, there are priests who are in the area, in the Amazonian area. Yeah? Some of them uh, come from Europe, some of them are French yeah? uh, or Italian or whatever, uh, Spanish, uh, which are very active also in solidarity, in helping, in defending the communities, the peasants, the indigenous against uh, the, the police, the army, the landowners, landowners who have their own armed uh, bands, etc. But also, I would like to stress, there are many Christians who participate together with others in common organizations. Yeah? Uh, I, legal organizations, for instance, uh, a uh, peasant movement like the landless peasant movement where there are many Christians who participate, political movements, political parties, ecological movements, in all these political and social movements, you find Christians, yeah? believers, Catholics, yeah? mainly, but also some Protestants. So they are present, not in, in broader movements, in, together with others. Uh, and this is also extremely important. So you have both forms of participation and both are important. Now, uh, friends, you will excuse me. I unfortunately <laughs> have to leave you, but uh, I was very, very happy to be able to take part in this initiative. Thank you, Michel. Thank you for being with us. Bye bye. And now I give the floor to Angelina. Yes, hello, thank you all for your inputs. Uh, my name is Angelina Yanopoulou. I work for Transform as a facilitator and I am based in Athens. Uh, I'm also more familiar, not with the Catholic Church background, but with the Orthodox Church background. I'm mentioning this because it is kind of related with my question. I draw from what Michel um, Levy said that, okay, the role of the church is not actually to build on a political strategy, and that's correct. But in my opinion, um, we do have such debates because we with the church to be part of a social alliance uh, that will actually contribute to the social change and the social transformation. And uh, my question is that, how is to be done uh, since we see that the, the church, uh, both the Catholic but also the Orthodox, are not united actually. Uh, it is not an organization that shares a common position. A Catholic Church now has Pope Francis uh, as the head of the church, who is a progressive uh, Pope, 
But on the same time, we see the Catholic Church in Poland and the role they have uh, in this um, authoritarian, completely to totalitarian framework, how they intervene on um, mat social matters like this um, law uh, regarding the abortion, the legal abortions. Uh, so when we talk about the church, we need to, to keep in mind what actually the church says. And it is also, also a question regarding how we address the people, because many people, um, uh, may, we, they may be familiar with what uh, Pope Francis say and uh, with his struggle also through the encyclicals, but they see at the same time the role of the church and the position of the church in its country. And many times it is very conservative, very authoritarian, very backwards, um, especially now during the pandemic. I have seen this in many countries and not only in mine. Uh, there is a big fight regarding how the church uh, is coping with the pandemic and how the church complies or not with the governmental measures. Here in Greece, we have a huge debate regarding if the churches need to be open, if the communion needs to be, needs to continue to work the same way, taking into consideration that it is dangerous, etc. And this creates a big debate in the public discourse and uh, also a kind of, it, it puzzles the left how we should, we should stand towards this. For example, a big part of the left here in Greece just blame the church and say, close the churches, close the churches. But this is not the point actually, uh, because the problem is not the churches to be closed, but how the communion should be um, facilitated, for example. Uh, but also, yes, how you will try to facilitate a dialogue between um, leftist progressive political forces and the church when we do witness that the church in some cases, in some countries, in some regions is extremely conservative and uh, serves completely the establishment. Thank you very much, Angelina. I think I can give the, the question to many of the participants uh, and who, who uh, might want to, to answer or comment on this and also to Karin's uh, question earlier. Um, but I go on now with, the, with Roland, uh, whom I have on the list. And maybe some others also of you want to uh, take the floor then. Roland and then Karl. Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for this event. Uh, we cannot hear you very well. Okay. Please speak um, up. Sorry. Um, maybe I can come closer to the microphone. Can you hear me now? A little bit better, but not very much. Is there something on your microphone, maybe? No, try again. Try again. So then it must be something with my microphone. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, my no, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, okay. So in this case, very short. Um, it's a question from, from my side as an agnostic person uh, to the uh, theological uh, oriented knowledgeable uh, persons. I'm very much, um, how to say, I like this event very much. It's, it's incredible for, for me to see the overlap uh, between the different approaches. And my uh, central question is now, um, what do you think about, um, let's say, agnostic, uh, leftist usual approaches and from the Catholic Church in the time of uh, what is called Anthropocene, the climate crisis? Um, because it's very funny for me what I, now started because I lack the words. That is my problem. Uh, because I'm religiously not able to express myself. So I just started calling it Mother Earth. I have no better uh, vocabularies. What do you think? Is, is it a proper way to express it like this? Um, because what I learned today is basically I, I could more or less subscribe to anything. Where do we have a 
is it a correct overlapping for common action, especially not even action, but reflection, or is it kind of weird, uh, old school, wrong understanding? Um, the point background, sorry, one more sentence is um, uh, the idea, uh, let's say the many radical ecologists start discussing spirituality uh, as a precondition for a successful uh, climate struggle. Uh, and that, whatever you have in mind there, I would be very uh, grateful to you if, if you could share it with me. Thanks. Thank you, Roland. Uh, and now uh, um, I take Chiara Galbasiani, as I have no woman uh, before on the list. Please, a question to Petra and Cornelia and then Karl Helmut. Yes, thank you. I'm Chiara Galbersanini, researcher at the Sofia University Institute. I have this question. I was particularly uh, impressed uh, and interested in the in the principle defined by the Pope in the uh, encyclica, uh, the universal uh, destination of common goods. As uh, also Petra was saying at the beginning of uh, this uh, fantastic discussion. And the, the question is, uh, could, this, the, could this principle defined by the Pope uh, contribute to uh, build a, a shared or a common um, social ethics, starting, for instance, uh, with the protection of common goods, such as environment, but not only that? Thank you. I have now Karl Helmut and Jose Manuel on the list. Should we hear them? And maybe you want also to comment on the others. First, I apologize for my clumsy English and poor pronunciation. But I would like to make a statement from the perspective of a secular person and uh, because my relationship with Pope's statements is functional. By this, I mean that is less a content of the declaration that moves me. It is a social and political function that these declarations have in the given political context. By function, I mean, do these declarations create and open up the possibility of moving more freely politically in the space of the churches and the society? Are they connectable? So Deutsch sagt man anschlussfähig to joint concrete projects. Or do they have a restrictive and inhibiting effect? I have read the declarations of the previous popes with great skepticism. They were written on the conservative tradition of the church. They were determined by conservative morals. They were designed to stabilize rule and integrate the labor movement into capitalism. I would like to emphasize two thoughts of the new uh, texts as remarkable for me. They are important because they enable people with left wings and emancipatory goals to refer to them in order to find independent ways of acting. Here are two examples. Firstly, the Pope no longer, de longer declares the question of property to be absolute and unchangeable. He goes on to write, quotation, for my part, I would observe that the Christian tradition has never recognized the right to private property as absolute. This is, it is therefore no coincidence that shortly after the encyclical was published in October, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung ran the headline, leaving the church, 
the Pope's criticism of capitalism would be one of one reason of this. <laughs> the demonization of the socialist view on private property is not repeated. That is very helpful and I'm therefore pleased with this papal declaration. Secondary, the Pope refers to the joint declaration with the Grand Imam in 2019, in which one can read, quotation, for this reason, I would like to reiterate here the appeal for peace, justice, and fraternity that we made together in the name of God, who has created all human beings equal in rights, duties, and dignity and who has called them to live together as brothers and sisters. It is a co if this is the common position of the Pope and the Imam, it is a great step forward. It is well known that the Declaration of Human Rights by Islam differs considerably from the Declaration of Universal Human Rights. The Cairo Dis Declaration of Human Rights of 1990 in Article 6 grants women the same dignity, but not the same rights as men. Quotation, woman, woman is equal to man in human dignity and has her own rights and to enjoy as well as duties to perform. So I, the quoted text in the Dubai Declaration and the quotation in Fratelli Tutti doesn't make this distinction. And therefore, I'm very happy. And I think that is a good point. And they are these two points to, for cooperation. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And uh, I give the floor to Jose Manuel. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, two previous words. The first is to present me very briefly. I am a Catholic. I'm a Portuguese. I'm a Catholic. Um, and I'm also a um, um, member of the direction of a left-wing political party here in Portugal. And I, am, I have been involved in the last years together with mm, many people present over here, which I uh, salute uh, in the, um, in the um, trajectory of a dialogue project uh, called Dialogue between Christians and Marxists. Um, the second previous word is to congratulate all of us, uh, but mainly those that have uh, organized this, this uh, webinar um, and mainly to 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 greet uh, Petra, Michael, uh, and Connie for their presentations, which I believe have been very um, interesting and very challenging. And I want to make only two small remarks. The first one is on the question, on the curious question about the possibility of the Pope being a communist. Um, the, the fact is that most of all, the Pope is a Christian and uh, perhaps we are not really accustomed to have the, a, a radical Christian as uh, a top um, leader of, uh, um, of the Catholic Church, to be, to be, to be honest. Uh, in fact, the, the Pope uh, is a, a Christian, a very conscient uh, Christian, uh, willing to remind all of us um, of the core of the Christian message beyond norms and beyond uh, rules for sex life or whatever. The core of the Christian message and of the Christian movement, which this Pope is um, very much willing to bring every day to 
to, to common citizens and to political leaders and to the public opinion is uh, the need to build a community um, always disputing dominant uh, economic and cultural criteria. I, I believe this was the, well, one of the most important roles played by a guy called Jesus 2000 years ago. And the Pope is a follower of this guy, um, uh, willing to remind the core of, uh, of, of, of what we are in, what we are called to do as followers of Jesus Christ. So this is it. Um, if this brings him close to some uh, doctrines or to some ideas which have tried historically to uh, implement some of the moral, political, ideological criteria um, uh, uh, fitting with uh, the historic circumstances, that's okay. But I would not fall into the trap of confusing what is the identity of this Pope and of his message with other proposals that are present over uh, 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 our um, uh, our public uh, of our public sphere, and my second remark is on my really uh, is to, is to come back to Connie's comment on a possible contradiction which she has denounced as a false contradiction between class struggle on the on the one side and social and political love which is the crucial message of the Pope in Fratelli Tutti in my, in my personal, personal view. Okay, so two words on this. First, um, uh, in fact, I, be I strongly believe, I deeply believe um, that both Christians and Marxists are together called in this very specific moment to build bridges around the construction of a community which emancipates people, okay? So, in fact, I believe that we are both called to this, to this challenge, okay? To this duty. Uh, but, the, and this involves what Michael has underlined, which is the critique, I would say the radical critique of the perversion of the economic and cultural dominant system, okay? The Pope does it very, very clearly in both Laudato Si and in Fratelli Tutti. And let's, let us be honest and fair. Previous Popes have, has, have, all, have also done the same radical critique, uh, despite uh, many differences with uh, Francis, but in terms of a critique of this kind of system, there are precedents which should not be underestimated. And the second uh, and final words is the following. Um, I, think, I, I think that uh, uh, what we are called to, to build is not really an idealistic or angelic community like that one dreamed by the hippie movement in the 60s, um, but one in which the tension between those at the top and those at the bottom is to be assumed as a permanent challenge. That's the way I interpret John's, St. John's words, uh, you will always have poor among you. Okay, so in fact, uh, uh, if, if you want to call it class struggle, please call it. If you want to call it uh, social tension, please call it. Uh, in fact, there is this kind of tension which is present at the core of the effort of building community. And we are not called to build a community which ignores this, but on the opposite, we are called to, be, to, to build community 
having this in mind and adopting criteria based on the gospel or on Karl Marx uh, scripts or whatever that try to overcome and to you know give a positive answer to this challenge. Sorry for having spoken so long. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I have no requests from the for the floor at the moment. So I give back to uh, Philip, Petra, and Connie. Yeah. Um, also, with with a, a view on the time, we have to be, uh, or it's it's good that we can uh, uh, that all the, the speakers can have a kind of last word, uh, but maybe last words in plural because there we have a lot of topics uh, and questions um, at the table. Um, and um, yeah, I think, well, I can, I will not uh, um, repeat all the questions, but maybe um, Petra, what, 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 do you want to start? Sorry, yeah, I can try to do so, even if that's really, really difficult now after all that has been said. Um, maybe uh, let me start with, uh, with the last, with um, uh, the comments by uh, Jose Manuel. And of course, when I, when I asked this question, is uh, Pope Francis a co communist? I did this in a kind of winking uh, way, you know, uh, kind of trying to build a bridge. And, uh, but, but it also came to my mind, you know, having the Focolare uh, people here as uh, kind of uh, the, 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 those who invited us to this dialogue. Um, and going back to their history, they have been accused of being communists because they tried to live uh, the community of goods. So in a way, that seems kind of uh, <laughs> paradigmatical <laughs> that there is. And, and, and maybe we can, we can, we can uh, draw a line here to what, what um, Connie said uh, regarding the great proximity of discourses. So we have some topics that really uh, interest and 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 really attach um, both sides, if you want to call them two sides. Um, and um, well, um, so many things have been said. Maybe um, the this notion of universal destination of created goods that could really be a, a common ground. And it's not something new that uh, Pope Francis brought up, but something really going back far into the uh, Christian teaching and tradition, going back to uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas, for example. And so this is really, really a, a tradition rooted deeply in, in, in Catholic social thought, uh, if you wish. Um, Roland mentioned um, the notion of spirituality and, and, and many uh, radical envir environmentalists um, stressing uh, that we need spirituality in order to really address um, the huge challenges in the Anthropocene. And I would, um, I would somehow agree um, not saying it has to be uh, Catholic spirituality or Christian spirituality, but uh, spirituality, but spirituality, or um, I would even say mysticism, understood in a very, very broad sense. Like uh, Dorothy Sölle talked about mysticism. Um, she said we need to democratize mysticism um, because uh, because it reminds us that we are all connected. It, it reminds us also of um, a vision of a world that is different from what we are experiencing now. It gives us in a way a prophetic vision of what could be and um, uh, helps us not to be satisfied with the status quo. Um, so in this sense, I would really say, well, a spirituality or um, some kind of mystical experience of this, everything is connected to everything. Uh, which we find in different uh, religious traditions is really important as a basis um, for, for um, social, economical commitment uh, in this age uh, of the Anthropocene, because 
uh, of course, the challenges are huge. They are almost overwhelming and we need something that we can uh, really go back to, something um, that is larger than we uh, are ourselves. Dorotezelle, to mention her again, uh, she also said that this um, um, groundedness in mysticism helped her um, to go on without being frustrated, without resentment, even in instances there um, at in a first step uh, failed and, and there was failure in her uh, social political or ecological commitment to still go on. And I would also say we need it. And here I come to the question of the relation of political love and class struggle. Um, how, can we, how can we do uh, class struggle in a way that we don't see the other as our enemies? And I think it's not by, just by chance that Pope Francis quotes Martin Luther King um, as one of uh, the, per, the people who inspired him writing Fratelli Tutti, uh, because Remember, um, Martin Luther King was the one who said, well, and, and, and also Mahatma Gandhi, um, it's not about uh, defeating the other, about defeating uh, the racist, the elite, um, but, but to winning them over. Uh, it, it's about winning them over, in a way, to making them our friends and, 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 and well, uh, helping them to see um, uh, to see the problems they are causing and, and, and then uh, acting differently. And um, what else did I want to say? <laughs> so many, so many things. I mean, Karin, you asked um, about, uh, you, you asked for the influence of, of the Pope and I'm, I'm not totally sure about that. I would say, um, I, I'm not sure if he was able to convince people who previously, um, took uh, quite an opposite position. But I would say what he does is that he gives gravity, that he gives influence to those who, um, who see things in a similar way as he sees them. And, and by giving those people and those um, currents in the Catholic Church, which of course is diverse and will stay diverse, <laughs> but he gives those, those uh, voices some influence, some gravity, and helps uh, to move on in this direction. So I would say, even if he was not able to, uh, to convince people who, who thought completely different before, it's important to have him as a pope because he, in a way, helps to pave the way uh, in this direction. And maybe as a last word, I'm, I'm really, really happy with this uh, webinar, with, uh, with our discussion. I'm so grateful for, um, for your talk, Connie, and also for the talk of uh, Michael Levy. And um, I think, yeah, he's, to, to maybe to conclude, when he, when he said, well, he's, he's a, he sees Pope Francis as a dreamer, I would say, well, in, in the sense that Martin Luther King said, I had a dream. We, we need those dreams. We cannot build a different society without having those dreams. So it's not a naive dreaming that is not in touch with reality, that does not see the real mm -hmm. conflicts, that just says, well, everything is great anyway. Um, not this naive dreaming, but, but a, a, real, a real dreaming with open eyes and, and seeing the, the problems we are facing, but also going beyond. Uh, thank you, Petra. Um, and I will directly uh, give the words um, to Connie because uh, Michael uh, has already left. He had another um, meeting, I guess. Uh, so, uh, Connie. Yeah, also I'm also really happy to have organized this uh, webinar. It, also, we will continue and we will looking for in which way we want to continue this. Maybe is it useful to, to discuss in the next ze webinar the uh, concrete project what we in which we can work together. Maybe 
we have to looking for in which direction we go forwards, what we want to do so. Uh, only one remark. Also, I was reading about also the the political love was for me a fun, <laughs> an, an, a new keyword, and I showed me how is it possible to bring the political dimension with the great feeling of yourself in <laughs> connection. And uh, this uh, brings me to to the point uh, between the uh, relationship between spirituality and political action. And that is for the Christian people easier to connect. And Fratelli Tutti is doing this. And the question is, what is the sp spirituality? And uh, such kind of question is in Fratelli Tutti. I don't know in which, uh, in which paragraph in this moment. But to what is the deepening sp spirituality of the left? And to bring both together the fighting, not against uh, the, the fighting as a social class that means uh, that the social class is strong connected, the terms of the social class are strong connected with the economy. And that is the point what I want to push forward. The concept of and the importance of economy and the influence of economy of the self-understanding of the people. And that is not the strongest point of, uh, uh, of the Pope, of course. But the question of spirituality of the left is an open question for me, how we can bring it together in the way that struggling is not only the point of the left. So, and uh, I was thinking about the paragraph, maybe you can help me to better understand this paragraph, 273. And uh, you can looking forward to this. And if you could give me some interpretation of this paragraph, it would be helpful for me to better understand what does it mean for myself and maybe in this point, the political love and class struggle. And I want to give you only one point um, for my thinking and also a point of, I ask myself, where are the different, where are the differences between us? And what is the differences between us? What is the difference between the non-religious people and religious people with the communist and not communist with the socialist and the Christians? Sometimes is it the same. Sometimes it's a self-understanding. Uh, I'm a left-wing communist and uh, Jose Manuel describe it. I'm a left-wing, I'm a member of the party, I'm a Christian, I'm all of this. <laughs> so. But in this moment, is it easy to understand yourself as <laughs> common, of course. But what are the differences? What is the differences of dialogue? That is the question behind. And uh, Angelina uh, pushed the topic of uh, the question of uh, women rights. And for me, it was surprising that one paragraph is only for women rights in this Fratelli Tutti. But what is missing? The, uh, the women have the same rights as men. That is concrete in this paragraph sentence. But what is the basic question of abortion? Of course. And that is not so easy to, also to find for this sentence a good solution. That means not that the Pope, and I think he doesn't support the Polish governments in this way. The Catholic Church, and I would say it's the same as we have in the, in the left-wing family. The Catholic family is diverse. And within the Catholic family, they also have big discussions. What is the self-understanding of the Catholic family in the 21st century? What is this understanding? And I have the feeling, I don't have the answer. I have to give my answer for myself. What is the left wing in, the, in this time? What I have to think in this direction? But uh, you, you hear the bells behind me. <laughs> uh, the question is how we can find the better understanding and uh, in which way we can say Dialogue is not to have the same position in every question. Dialogue is heard, is a, is a kind of work, is a kind of intellectual work, and we have to find common 
points. And of course, we have to say in these points, we cannot go together. That is dialogue. That means we are in different families, strong connected with each other, but we have, of course, differences between. And we have to see in which way we can forward with the knowledge of different understandings of important points of ourselves, of our own ideas. And that is a challenge for both sides of the dialogue. So, thank you. So, thank you, Connie. Um, so, I, I will now give a, a few last words for our uh, webinar. Um, and I want to, to come to, uh, back to the question of uh, uh, Karin uh, from the beginning. Uh, is the audience of Pope Francis growing? Uh, Petra also uh, uh, spoke about this a little bit. But um, I really would like to say, yes, it, it is growing. But to be honest, I'm not sure if it, if this is like, if it is like this, if it is growing. Uh, but I think it would be helpful to have a kind of analysis um, about uh, the audience of Pope Francis. Uh, in which way are people affected or positively affected by Pope Francis? And um, who are, is affected, affected by it? Um, yeah, but I think especially in which way? Uh, because as we know, um, uh, in some ways, Pope Francis has a very clear uh, language, uh, like uh, this economy kills, for example. In other things, uh, he has also kind of diplomatic uh, way to speak. So there are uh, for sure uh, some possibilities to be on the side of Pope Francis. Uh, and well, we don't know if this is one side. Um, but yes, I think an analysis could be helpful. So just about this. I'm very happy that uh, you all participated, or we all participated in our first webinar. Um, and as usual for a seminar or a webinar, uh, we could not answer all the questions. We could not speak about all the interesting and important topics, but at least we could uh, listen to some of them and we could uh, um, bring up some of the topics. And more important is that we will uh, continue with our process of dialogue, with our process of uh, discussion um, to learn from each other and uh, yeah, to analyze um, uh, more what. Uh, um, the role of Pope Francis, the, the role of, uh, uh, or the situation of left-wing parties, and so on. Um, yeah, and I invite you uh, to our next webinars uh, already. And maybe just one last word, uh, which is in, my, is in my mind of this discussion, uh, is uh, dreaming with open eyes. Uh, I like this word. And uh, in this sense, I hope that we can continue dreaming with open eyes. And um, yeah, thank you for your participation.